So the core idea behind democracy is really incredibly simple. Indeed, it's inspiringly simple. And it's one commitment. That government means we all participate in government. And what that means in America is that in the representative system, we all participate equally. The framers of our Constitution were obsessed with mechanical things. And when they thought of what that meant, they had images of machines in their head, and they spoke of dependencies producing this equality. Madison in Federalist 52 promised us an institution that would have a branch Congress, the House, that would be, quote, dependent on the people alone. And by the people, what he said was, quote, not the rich more than the poor. Now, this idea of equality is not surprising for a republic that grew out of something called the Declaration of Independence, which in its first words said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men, okay, all white men, <coughs> But all men are created equal, equal. And it's because they're equal that they could commit to the idea of not the rich more than the poor. And because they, they were equal, we would have a system that would be dependent on the people alone, equal. But the truth is the document that they signed, the Constitution, is not consistently committed to equality. Indeed, at the core of that document, there is a compromise. A compromise with this principle of equality, and that compromise is this room, the Senate. It drove Madison nuts that his brilliant theory of an equal democracy had to be compromised by the need to get the small states to join the big states. Theory met reality. And the product was ideals compromised by necessity. It was necessary, they said, to make this compromise, to make it so we could have a union, and we got a union. Now, I don't know if we hadn't gotten a union whether slavery would have ended sooner or not. We're not allowed to think about that sort of thing. What we're supposed to accept is that the Constitution has a principle and an exception. And the principle is democratic. And the exception is inequality. But the problem we have today is that this exception is becoming the rule. And there is no institution that better symbolizes the way this exception of inequality is becoming the rule than this institution, the United States Senate. The history of the Senate is a constant fight against democratic ideals. In the period before the Civil War, it was the Senate that tried to negotiate the compromise that would preserve slavery. And for a brief moment after the Civil War, the Senate led for the first time principles of equality, Massachusetts' jo uh, Charles Sumner at the forefront of that fight. But after Sumner died, it was 82 years before the Senate allowed a single civil rights bill to be passed. It was the Senate that held America back because of the unequal power that was living here. And even to this day, principles like the filibuster make it so the minority controls the majority because the principle of democracy does not exist in this place. This is an institution that makes us think of great men, and yes, great men, 97.5% of senators have been men, 50 have been women. They are really great women who are in the United States Senate, but this institution makes us think of great people. But we should recognize it is an unequal institution. It is institutional inequality. And that inequality produces a problem because we've taken this idea of inequality and let it grow. This inequality has grown throughout our democratic system. It's grown here when the framers set up the Senate 
the inequality was big, Delaware vote, one vote in Delaware was worth 13 votes in Virginia, but that gap has only grown. Now one vote in Wyoming is worth 66 votes in California. But it's not just here in the Senate that inequality has grown. This principle of inequality has spread throughout our democratic system. Think about the freedom to vote. Do we have an equal freedom to vote in America? Well, the truth is, through techniques to suppress votes, as Charles uh, Stewart at MIT has calculated, more than 16 million Americans saw their votes suppressed in the last election. They have less equal access to our democracy than the rest of us do. Or think about the presidential election. Because of the Senate, in the way that we select electors to our electoral college, the winner-take-all system means that if you happen to be in the minority in your state, we count your votes simply to throw them away. A million people voted for Donald Trump in Massachusetts. All of those votes were thrown away. The winner-take-all system means unless you happen to live in a state where you're the majority, you do not count, which means 52 million Americans had their vote thrown away in the last election. Or think about the House of Representatives, this innovation created by a governor from this state, Governor Jerry, gerrymandering. There are only 45 competitive seats in the United States House, which means for the rest, 90% of the House, the winner is the winner of the party that controls that seat, which means that if you are a minority, a Democrat in a Republican seat or a Republican in a Democrat seat, your vote doesn't matter. Your views don't matter. Your congressman cares not a whit about what you think about because you could never matter to his or her re-election. Again, a million votes by Republicans in Massachusetts. There isn't a single Republican member of the House from Massachusetts. This gerrymandering system means 89 million Americans have a vote that doesn't matter in the House. 89 million unequal because of the way we count votes. And then the Senate, the Senate two per state, what that means is 114 million Americans have a vote that weighs less than the vote of just 26 million Americans who happen to live in the states that are small states in the country. But the biggest challenge to equality in America is money. The way we fund campaigns. We fund public campaigns privately, which means members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress, dialing for dollars. For you kids, that's a telephone. That's the way that telephones used to work. <laughs> Dialing for dollars, calling people across the country to, ra country to raise the money they need to get their party back into power, to get back into Congress themselves. But who are they calling? They're not calling average Americans. They're calling no more than 100,000 Americans who are the primary funders of these congressional campaigns. 100,000 Americans, which means that 139.9 million Americans just don't count equally in this system. They are excluded. And even this graph is a little bit unrepresentative. I'm going to take one man, I'm going to divide him into a fifth. One fifth of one man on that graph represents the power in money, and the rest of us are unequal. Add all these things together, and the sum is quite clear, right? We are not equal as citizens in the United States. This core promise of a representative democracy has been denied which means they can't represent us because they are so busy <laughs> representing them. We can't get what we want. We won't get what we want unless what we want, we, as in America represented equally, unless what we want happens to be what the most powerful in this system always want. This constitution that had a principle and an exception has transformed the exception into the rule. Inequality is the norm. Now, we've had fights for equality 
in our history. Maybe the most tragic and inspirational fight in Americans' history for equality is the fight of African Americans for 400 years to achieve equality inside this system, first freedom and then equality. But the striking thing of that fight is that in a certain way, they had an advantage over the fight we must wage. Because in that 400 years, and that fight's not over, but in that 400 years, no one ever doubted whether the system was treating African Americans equally or not. That inequality was clear to all. But this inequality, this inequality is the carbon monoxide of a democracy, invisible, tasteless, odorless. It spreads without anyone recognizing it. We can't even imagine it, especially we white <coughs> males can't imagine it. Oh my gosh, we're in a system where we're not equal? That's just not possible in America, right? But the truth is, this system is deeply unequal and we don't even notice it. We accept it and like a cancer, it eats away at the soul of our democracy. Now, I've spent the last decade, more than the last decade, working to figure how we could rally the moonshot it would take. The moonshot it would take to get our equality back. I'm not even sure it's possible. Just like those who planned the moonshot, I'm not sure it's possible. But I've learned three things that I think are essential if we're going to make this fight work. Number one, we have to fight as citizens, not as Republicans and not as Democrats, but as citizens first. We have to find a way to rise above the partisan divide that kills us in our opportunity to make a democracy work again. We have to find a way to speak to each other as equals, not as enemies. The politicians are very bad at this. They live the politics of hate, and we have to get above that. That's number one. Number two, we have to learn that this fight is actually a fight for others, because who loses most because we can't govern? It is our kids who lose most. Think of every important issue that we think we must find a way to address, climate change, we're wrecking our climate, but those of us over 50, it's not gonna really matter much to us. Like my house might, when my children are there, become a, uh, a, a nice uh, waterfront property because of the rising water levels, but I'll never see that. The people who suffer that will be our children. The debt that we spread because we have no capacity to control how our government behaves. That debt is literally us borrowing from our children. Thank you very much. We will never pay them back. A healthcare system, which is so screwy and inefficient because of our gifts to pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies. This is a system that burdens not us, us who can afford and have the health care that our employers give us. The people it burdens are our children who can't afford and won't have health care because, again, we don't have a democracy to deliver that to them, or the economy that seems to be stuck. It can't go up for the average American. It's only the rich, only the rich who gets any better. The only opportunities we give are the opportunities to the very rich. Who, burden, who is burdened by that except our children in every one of these areas? The point is, if we have a fight here, it's a fight for them. And if we have a motive to the fight, it's the motive of love for them. Love for them first teaches us what we must do now. And then finally, this has got to be a fight for respect, a kind of self-respect. Because when you think about the extraordinary struggle that African Americans went through, the dignity of that struggle to achieve the equality which they have fought for for 400 years, or women, fighting for the chance to participate in a democracy and live in a society as equal, the dignity and self-respect that fight showed. Where is the dignity and the self-respect for the rest of us? How can we accept a system that treats us like this? We need leaders here. 
We need the leaders to remind us that we can rise above this partisan divide. We need leaders to remind us we inherited a democracy we could be proud of, but we hand to our children an embarrassment. We need leaders to ignite with us, within us, the courage that it will take to fight those who benefit from this unequal system. We need leaders, and those leaders are you. Are you citizens or are you Republicans? Are you citizens or are you Democrats? Is it country first or party first? That's your choice. Do you have the love for your children to be willing to stand and fight for something that gives them the chance that we had from our parents? And can you recover the dignity of the soldier who goes to war not to fight for a party, but to fight for a democracy in the name of equality? This is a beautiful space. It reminds us of many great leaders, leaders, many from this state, including the two great Kennedys who are celebrated at this museum. But let us also be reminded that a leaders alone have never changed anything. That change only comes when it comes from you. Lead here. Thank you very much. Thank you.